Uh, well, I will uh, get started then. Um, my name is Martin Hinchelwood. Um, I'm a, a professional Scrum trainer uh, with Scrum.org. Uh, I have been for 11 years. Um, I'm a professional Kanban trainer. I have been for about two weeks, so that's pretty good. It's a new thing for me, uh, but I'm also a Microsoft MVP. Um, I was awarded uh, the MVP in uh, 2008, uh, and I've been awarded every year since then. Uh, my category is DevOps, and I have been working uh, with the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft uh, for all of that, all of that time. Um, I don't work with them as much today. Uh, a lot of them have moved over to, to GitHub. Um, but if you work a lot with Microsoft, you might have noticed uh, that something has changed uh, there over the last um, few years. Uh, they're a different organization now than they were. Um, and I want to talk about the catalyst for that difference. Uh, so what were the things that led up to that change and how did they, how did they change as an organization? Um, so I have a, a, a little uh, uh, comment first around um, DevOps. We kind of we need to define this idea of DevOps. Um, everybody really has a different idea of what it is. It, it means radically different things to, to different people. It can be automation, a job title, uh, uh, development and operations working together. It can be faster, smaller releases, any of those things. Um, but it's really a, a set of ideas. It's a mindset. Um, so I just want to uh, show you a little, uh, a little video. Um, there's two parts to it. Uh, uh, the first part is um, what software development used to be like, and the second part is uh, what it should be like today, but using a metaphor. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stopped. 67 seconds for a pit stop. And this is 2013. So still quite a while. So you maybe have noticed that that second one was a little bit quicker. What is the difference between these two stories? Well, what one is the increase in the number of people, but you can kind of think about it as automation. Um, this uh, the, the 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 modern um, team has um, uh, lots of people doing very individual tasks uh, that are able to make the whole process more efficient. Software delivery has become a team sport with lots of people working together, lots of automation in the process that help us uh, do things faster. Uh, there's actually a, a, a misguided uh, belief that these are professional uh, pit crews. Uh, it would actually be too expensive uh, to transport all of these people all over the world. Um, so you can actually volunteer to be on a pit crew um, and you can you can do this work and everybody has a very specific task they have to do and they train uh, really heavily for a few weeks before uh, the event and then they provide that automation of, of changing the tires. Um, so they've increased the number of people, there's more people working together in order to do that. 
Um, I don't know if you uh, noticed, um, but at the very back there, uh, there's somebody with a spare jack there, right at the back. That fellow uh, uh, right here at the back is, has a spare jack. So at some point, this jack must have failed, uh, and they have somebody there with a backup just in case. So they've perhaps gone through many iterations and learn from their mistakes. So these are all, uh, all these people are working together in concert, um, like like automation. And if you notice uh, the, the, the commentator, uh, if you could hear the commentator, uh, was saying that, you know, they finished with the refueling and now they're they're finalizing changing the tires. And you saw how long it took uh, uh, to change the tires. That was a, a really, uh, long 60 seconds uh, for a pit stop uh, and filling up with fuel wasn't the slowest thing that was finished about halfway through uh, the longest thing was changing the tires but what about in the modern video um you saw that the um tires were changed all four tires were changed at the same time they were changed very quickly but also if you notice they didn't refuel it at all well after fixing the problem of changing the tires and making it faster uh, what you probably find is the next uh, longest thing was fueling the car so they changed the way uh, uh, they, they they fuel the cars and if you remember in the in the 90s there was a bunch of really high profile accidents in the pit because they were trying to use bigger and bigger fuel intakes to get the fuel in uh, as quickly as possible um, and some accidents resulted in fires and, and problems uh, so what they did was they adapted again and changed to let's make the cars more efficient uh, so that they don't have to refuel at all, which is why they didn't even put any fuel in in that particular case. So if you were to ask the question, what is DevOps? I, I tend to use uh, a gentleman called Donovan Brown's uh, definition of DevOps, because I think it, it works really well in, in this circumstance. DevOps is the union of people, processes and products uh, to enable the continuous delivery of value to our end users. Um, and there's really two sides to this coin. One side says uh, uh, DevOps and the other side uh, says Agile. Um, and Agile is just a way of working to enable uh, continuous delivery of value to our end users. So they've really got the same uh, outcome. But it's interesting to note that we can be really, really good at Agile, but if our engineering practices aren't up to scratch, uh, then it's still very difficult to deliver work. And if you look at the outcome of the, the DORA report from 2008, um, customers that have uh, uh, good DevOps, have high performing DevOps teams, um, spend 66% less time on customer support issues and 50% uh, less time uh, on customer identified defects because they've maybe found them earlier because uh, they spend more time on that. Uh, and it is in fact interesting, I uh, teach a, a class uh, called the Professional Scrum Foundations. I've just been renamed to the Applying Professional Scrum and in that we build actual software in the class. They build a little, a little website. Um, and in all of my time teaching that class, I have had one team that had somebody who was uh, a little bit of a, a DevOps expert that understood those things. And in one 30 minute sprint, so 30 minutes of doing the work, this team went from zero, so no code, no application, just a list of requirements, to having all of the code under source control, uh, an automated build, uh, created in Azure DevOps and a continuous delivery pipeline built and deployed uh, to Azure by the end of 30 minutes, as well as building the product. If you think about uh, Scrum being 25 years old, Scrum is celebrating its 25th uh, anniversary, and uh, the Agile Manifesto is 20 years old. Um, 20 years ago, it was hard to deploy software to production. Today, it's not so hard, but we all need to go on a journey uh, to figure out how to get there. And I can think of a number of epic, epic failures uh, that happened along the way. Uh, the first one uh, that I can think of, there was a multi-million, uh, sorry, multi-million, multi-billion dollar uh, mistake uh, was one of poor quality. 
Can you think of a poor quality product that this might be? I thought of Windows Vista. Windows Vista was a massive uh, quality failure, so much so that they had to pull uh, al almost all of the features they thought they were going to ship uh, in Windows Vista uh, and backtrack them all in order to just get the product out the door. Um, and it did suffer from stability issues uh, even after release, and it took them a long time to fix it, and Windows 7 uh, became that uh, uh, final fix. So that was a, a quality issue, it was engineering practices. But they resolved, they resolved the engineering practices issue. Windows 7 uh, and all future versions of Windows have been very high quality in comparison. Um, but they had another issue, and this was with the same team. Again, a multi-billion dollar failure, which is a mismatch to customer desires, which was Windows 8. Uh, if you remember Windows 8, you either loved it or you hated it. I liked it. I think I'm one of the only ones that liked it, but it definitely uh, had its problems, but they were usability problems. They weren't quality problems. So this is this is the story about how M Microsoft became agile and changed from a particular product from a boxed product into a service in order to facilitate that, in order to shorten the feedback loops. So Microsoft's journey into this world of uh, DevOps actually started uh, around 2010 uh, with the Team Foundation Server team uh, in the DevOps division. Um, and they had realized by 2010 uh, that they weren't having a good time uh, delivering software. They were getting behind the customer's need. Uh, so they, they, they felt that they couldn't uh, deliver stuff to meet customers' needs, and they needed to change uh, the story in order to get there. Uh, and what they did, this is kind of the rough uh, flow of time uh, to the existence of Azure DevOps, uh, but they started sprinting uh, in August 2010 um, and just moved TFS to the cloud. It took them uh, six weeks to get TFS up and running in the cloud in a in a um, proof of concept uh, scenario and then they just started building on it and working from there um, pushing it towards uh, production um, and it did go ga uh, in 2014 uh, so that's still a lot of sprints down the line but if you're like me i was kicking the tires uh, well before then and they went into a public preview uh, in 2012. Um, so there's a lot of work 29 sprints uh, to get to something uh, that they could be happy uh, providing a public preview for, uh, but it really uh, started pushing their engineering and changing the way they did everything in order to get there. Uh, so that's kind of the the, the birth birth of uh, Azure DevOps that we're going to going to discuss, and it was primarily allowed and pushed uh, by uh, Satya Nadella, uh, an engineer back in charge of Microsoft. And I think this is a really important statement that he's talking about here. Um, he would any day of the week trade off features for our own productivity. He would rather his engineers were working on things that helped support their own productivity, automation, DevOps, paying back technical debt, make ourselves more productive than spend time adding new features because it pays dividends in the end. It's much more valuable for you as engineers uh, to spend that time on uh, optimizing your processes uh, than it is on delivering customer value because if we don't optimize our processes delivering customer value is difficult let's make that easy um, and that's what he's he's getting at here and if you think about microsoft in 2010 um, you'll remember that they didn't really release stuff very often azure uh, um azure devops tfs uh, was released once every two years, so was Visual Studio. Uh, Windows was probably on a between four and six year cadence. Um, they didn't release very often. Today, uh, that's not true. I have some data here. It's actually from 2000, November 2008, 183,000 deployments a day. That's more deployments per day than they have people that work for Microsoft. Um, and you can see that the stats are ridiculous there. They've got 96,000 software engineers using Azure DevOps, 6.3 million builds a month, 5 million work items 
viewed per day in 500 million test executions. Uh, these are very, very big numbers. Uh, back in 2010, these numbers were tiny. Uh, deployments per day wouldn't even register. It would have zero point, and then there would be some more zeros before the first one. So how did they do that? How did they uh, move that needle and change that story? Well, they've been on a, a really long journey and they, they, they're they still not finished. This is uh, just like uh, the Spotify uh, um, story. Um, it is a journey. This is one point in time on uh, this team's journey towards agility uh, and this organization's journey. Uh, don't take anything here and think you have to do it that way in order to be successful. Um, these are just this company's learnings. You need to find your own uh, path to agility. Um, but there might be learnings in here that you can use as well. They've done this at scale. Uh, but they found that there were there were five key habits that they had to form um, in, in um, moving towards agility and having a service that would provide value to their users. Uh, the first one is customer focus. So focus laser focused on the customer and what they need. Uh, team autonomy. Uh, creating happy teams that are able to uh, uh, collaborate around solving problems. Uh, shifting left, uh, which is about quality enablement, uh, pushing as much uh, things to uh, um, the, 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 the engineering space as possible uh, so that we can validate uh, those things there and not find things later. Um, and also uh, uh, the other two, are a product first mindset. So we have to think about um, our, our product first and foremost, not our time limited project or th next thing we want to do. It's within the scope of the overall product and the overall product is really important. Um, and we need our infrastructure to be a, a flexible resource. So infrastructure as a flexible resource uh, is that last one. Uh, so they're not done with their transformation. A lot of the data I have in here is from around that 2008 time, and they're already three years further down the line. Uh, we all know that uh, a lot of the Azure DevOps team have moved over to uh, GitHub. Uh, Microsoft are definitely uh, betting on uh, that horse and building up that same culture uh, over at the GitHub team as well. Uh, but this is true for the for the Windows team, uh, for other teams inside of Microsoft, and I'll I'll mention those where I can as I go through uh, uh, this this story, what, what other teams have done in that space where it's relevant. Uh, but this is primarily about the Azure DevOps team. So the first thing they found uh, that they need to do is you need to listen to your customers. Um, it sounds fairly obvious, listen to our customers, uh, but so many teams don't uh, do this. Um, and I'm not talking about just listening to the moan about the quality of the product. Um, I want uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative data. Um, so I'm going to be looking at um, the, the reporting of problems and features uh, that users want. So I, you need some way for, for your users uh, to be able to report those things. Because uh, users are sometimes different from the people purchasing your product. They can sometimes be the same, but they can also uh, be different as well. So it's uh, key to get that. Um, even Microsoft are in a position where a lot of questions get asked about their products on Stack Overflow. They monitor the teams that build those features, monitor Stack Overflow um, for questions uh, and problems and uh, difficulties that people have, especially if you're building developer tools, that's, that's a good place to be, but there are other uh, tools and techniques for that. Um, they also have uh, making a, a suggestion and reporting a problem built into their product. Um, you want to make it as easy as possible for uh, your customers to provide feedback and having that built straight into the product uh, is one of the best ways to do that. Um, there's a number of times when I've been using products um, and something frustrating has happened and you go looking for how can I provide feedback or how can I complain about that problem um, and you most products today uh, have some kind of uh, feedback and then do something with that data um, every piece of feedback you provide for the Azure DevOps team makes its way into the hands of the team uh, that owns that feature every piece of feedback uh, makes its way there 
Um, I think they, you know, they do some swearing analysis and make sure that the things aren't uh, rude and obnoxious. But uh, in general, that feedback makes it all the way back to that team. Um, and here you can actually see uh, a list of a whole bunch of uh, customers. The name of the customer has been removed to protect the innocent, uh, but it's actually showing uh, their uh, um, engaged users in each of the different services uh, that they offer. So they're overall engaged users. Um, and I'll tell you uh, the one, one, two, three, fourth from the top uh, is one of my customers, uh, oil field services in uh, uh, Norway, uh, Houston. Um, and they have about 5,000 people uh, using the service on any one day. So they're looking at that stats and not just of the high end users. Uh, they need to not forget about the low end users as well. If you or I uh, have a problem in the service, we might just be one person, uh, but one person is all it takes to damage a reputation. So don't don't just look at statistics and data. Make sure you focus on real individuals that are having problems and help them solve those problems. Um, part of getting here, um, the, you, you need a concrete definition of done. Um, I'm going to share with you this team's definition of done. I don't think this definition of done is for a, 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 a team that has not uh, been doing this for a long time. This is a very, very mature definition of done. And their definition of done is live in production, collecting telemetry, supporting or diminishing the starting hypothesis. You're going to need data to build the right thing for your users. While it's great to get feedback from your users, it's great to get that uh, story direct from them, get them into your uh, uh, sprint reviews and get that feedback. Um, people lie. People don't always tell the truth. People always don't know the truth. So it's important to get data. Are you collecting telemetry uh, for all of the features that you have? Uh, broadly speaking, the uh, Visual Studio uh, team uh, intake about seven terabytes of data per day. That's the stats I heard last. Um, and they have an analysis platform that allows them to slice and dice that data uh, by customer, which customers are having problems. Um, what does the data look like uh, for engagement? Are less people engaging now than yesterday? We just did a release. Did that increase engagement or reduce engagement? What did we do in that release? How did it affect? Uh, the results. How are people using the system now? So collect as much data as you can. Anonymous data is fine. Um, it doesn't have to identify individuals, uh, but you need to understand how people are using your product in order to be able to, to support them well. Um, measure important KPIs. Right? Measure what's important for your team. Uh, this is a, a, an engineering scorecard here where you can see um, the agile code sharing continuous integration is the groups and then there's individual teams. Uh, let me put my mouse there. Individual teams, there's engineering productivity, WIT Z, WIT PI, uh, those are individual teams. And for each team, they're looking at, uh, for example, uh, live site repair work items older than two sprints. So if we've had a live site incident, that's where our production's down. We've identified some issues that need to be fixed how stale are they? Uh, so if they're older than two sprints, maybe the team's not taking care of them. There's a couple, you can see there's a, a couple of teams that have uh, some items in there. Uh, and live site repair work items completed within two sprints, have they actually been able to, to complete things and various other metrics. So you need to understand how what your teams do is affecting production if you want to have a high quality uh, system. So here's some stuff that they do at uh, collect. Um, I think for most of you here, it's going to be important what they don't collect as well. Uh, but usage, how your customers are using the system. Uh, if you're building a website, you can stick Google Analytics on there and get quite a lot of uh, uh, this information uh, that's freely available. Um, I use App Insights on most of my applications so that I can collect some of this data and figure it out. Uh, velocity, but not the velocity you think it is. This is at time to build. So when adding a feature, how quickly uh, can you get it built? How quickly can the developer test it? Yeah, so setting up environments locally. Uh, I have a customer that it takes uh, up to eight hours uh, to do a build uh, of their system. So a developer writing code can't find out whether that code really works 
within eight hours? Um, how do you shorten that loop? Time to self-test. Uh, time to deploy, you know, getting into an environment where you can uh, see things going. Uh, and how uh, quickly can we find a problem and learn from it? That's the type of metrics that they're collecting in the velocity. And then they have a bunch of metrics that you would expect around live site. Uh, they are running a large at scale uh, uh, web based uh, platform. Uh, so how quickly do they detect problems, communicate with customers, mitigate them, uh, the impact to customers, all of those kind of things that you would expect uh, from a live site. Um, and then things that they do not, because it has a negative impact uh, on the teams, is this idea of original estimate, completed hours. Uh, there is no value in, in going into that. It has a negative impact on people's behavior. Obviously, lines of code. Nobody wants to measure developers by lines of code written. Uh, team capacity, team burn down, team velocity, and number of bugs found. Uh, these are all... Uh, metrics that have a negative impact on the team. If you measure the number of bugs found, you will find less bugs. But we want to find in action those bugs, so we can't measure a team with that. I like a team that measures that themselves, but we don't need to look at it. We want to uh, build teams that are able to do that. So that was being customer obsessed. Um, now we need to look at uh, the next piece, and that that's this idea of iterating over the pain of find the thing that is hardest in your process and do it more and then do it again. Keep doing it, keep feeling that feeling that pain and fix the problems. Some of those problems you might need to re-architect your software in order to make testing easier. You might need to re-architect your software to make deployment easier, to do continuous delivery, to move to those new modern practices of getting faster uh, uh, and delivering faster. And you, you have to feel that pain to do something about it. Um, so you need to, to, to get in there and, and evaluate that. And in fact, the, prior to this transition, uh, the Azure DevOps team, which was the TFS team at the time, uh, they were doing two year cycles with a, a, a service pack uh, halfway. Um, so this was two years of work um, code, test and stabilization to a beta, and then code and test and stabilization to an RTM. And what they found uh, was that even once they shipped the beta, customers would give them a whole bunch of feedback. Yeah, well, we want this feature, we want that feature, this is how our business has changed over the year that you've been working on the beta. But all of their time was already booked for the code, test and stabilization for the RTM. So they're not going to be able to get that feedback into this release. So it'll have to go into the next release, which means at beta, that feedback can't be actioned for three years. The customers will not get those features for three years unless they take the beta in which it's two cases, two years. That's too long uh, to wait between that. So they moved uh, very quickly. They just moved straight headlong into a three week sprint cycle. Uh, but they decided they needed a safety net. So a little safety net came in there and they had uh, a stabilization uh, phase uh, between sprints five and six. They thought that would be a good idea. And what they wanted to see uh, was a kind of bug trend like this line A that, you know, we're gonna introduce bugs and defects and some technical debt, and then we're gonna pay it back. Uh, and then we're gonna have a little bit more as we do more features and pay it back. And we have that little ebb and flow of an acceptable level of technical debt. But because this stabilization sprint existed, this six week stabilization sprint existed, many people on the teams thought, well, we need to ship this feature so we can fix that in the stabilization phase. We can, we've got time to fix that later. And instead, technical debt and bug rates rocketed up uh, uh, as as they headed towards that stabilization phase because of that deadline at the end of sprint five, um, and they ended up with massive amounts of additional technical debt. Uh, they actually they deployed to production and ended up having uh, massive uh, problems because the quality wasn't there. So they did a take three and they just split their uh, two year time frame down into three week sprints. 
uh, with a little bit of overlap for deployment because it's a big system and it takes a long time to deploy. It, it, at the time, it was taking about a week to deploy. Today, it can take up to three or four weeks uh, to roll out a deployment across the whole platform. Um, but then they've got three weeks uh, of work. The deployment starts happening and the team moves on to the next sprint. So they have that kind of staggered uh, uh, set up there. I'll explain how that works from a branching model perspective uh, a little bit later, depending on the time. So they moved straight to that three week model and they found that moving to that cadence of working software at the end of every sprint done increments of value at the end of every single three week sprint meant that they started having to pay back technical debt to make that happen. They had to make their code easier to read, easier to understand, easier to change, easier to test. And that resulted in an extra kickback for uh, the management of uh, uh, the team of the investors in the product. And that's that in 2012, they were actually delivering only 22 features to production each year. They had that much technical debt that they were spending 90% of their time struggling with the complexity of their software versus adding new features. So there's only 22 features to production each year. And then sprint on sprint, they paid back a little bit of their technical debt and even within a year, they boosted that to 60 features. That's almost three times the number of features uh, in a year, um, and then boosted it all the way up. Uh, this, only, this data only goes up to 2017. Uh, I think they settled uh, around 300 uh, features to production each year for the same number of people as they had in 2012. Their headcount did not go up dramatically. Uh, so they ended up getting faster responses to customers, faster responses to market changes. They delivered more value to the customers because they're able to deliver, spend more time adding value and delivering features. Um, so it's a massive productivity bump uh, for this team by paying back that technical debt. And that technical debt in 2012 was six, seven years of baggage. Uh, it took six, six, seven years to dig the hole and it took six, seven years to dig themselves out of it. Um, that's that's kind of how that works. You, technical debt is not free. All technical debt is risk um, for your business. Uh, so they had to maintain, even though they were they were moving to agility, it doesn't mean it's a free for all. They still need to maintain that enterprise level of uh, rigor. So they actually they wanted to use GitHub Flow. Um, if you're familiar, Git Flow is a very complicated process. GitHub Flow is very straightforward. You just have a straightforward branch with topic branches. Uh, but they found that um, they have that unique thing where a release takes longer than a sprint. Um, so they, at the end of every sprint, they cut a release branch. That release branch only exists for the duration of the next sprint. Uh, and then they cut the next one and start deploying that. Um, so that allows them to have that flexibility of they can fix something in production uh, while not having a lot of baggage of extra branches and different versions and that kind of thing. So it's still a continuous flow of value. Uh, that's sp Sprint uh, 129 results in branch M129 and it only exists for the next three weeks and then it's overwritten by M130 from Sprint 130. Uh, you can see the little red dot there. Uh, all bugs are fixed in master. No bugs are ever uh, fixed in the release branch. Um, because if you fix it in the release branch and you forget to merge it to master, you get a regression. If you fix it in master, uh, worst thing that happens is you break production for a moment, but you don't get a regression. Uh, so they always fix in master and then uh, cherry pick the changes they can or re-implement the change in the release branch if the code's changed that much. And keep going through the through the process. In order to support this model, uh, you actually need some additional engineering uh, practices. You're, you're going to have to do feature flags. Um, feature flags are, are the linchpin of almost every organization out there that's doing continuous delivery. Uh, Facebook uses feature flags. Uh, Google uses feature flags. Uh, Google Chrome and, and uh, Microsoft and Windows and Azure DevOps use feature flags. Um, it allows you to uh, reduce the technical debt of integration because if a team is using something that uh, you have created, you can create the new thing while not inconveniencing them. So they've got time to take uh, that new thing. So you can actually have both sets of code uh, as viable paths. Um, you create uh, a new piece of code 
and then you flip the switch when you're ready. Uh, and that also allows you, from a customer's perspective, uh, to um, allow users to flip that feature flag. So you can do dark launches, you can do private previews, uh, you can do all sorts of uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, but this came at a little bit of risk. Um, you know, what could go wrong? Uh, we're going to turn on uh, these 20 feature flags just before this big reveal event. If uh, you've been to uh, any of Microsoft's big launch events, you know, so all these features become live. Um, and they, they've turned on it before, like just before the keynote and taken down uh, the entire system because it just wasn't ready yet. It did not go well. Uh, so what they, they do now is they actually have a policy where um, you can't show anything at a conference um, unless it's been in production for at least a week uh, before uh, you do the conference. That way you're less likely to have problems. So if you go into whatever tool you like uh, just before at launch, you will see uh, uh, those, <laughs> those features available uh, right away. So make sure uh, you protect yourself as well. And with that, into the production first mindset where you really have to focus on uh, live sites. Uh, production is all important. You need the people that wrote the code supporting the code. We write better code as software engineers if we know we have to support it. We'll think about uh, what we, the ways we don't want woken up at three o'clock in the morning. And if something does wake us up at three o'clock in the morning, we don't want that to happen again. Uh, so we spend a lot more time on quality. Uh, we need to analyze those, the impact, the root cause, uh, detection and mitigation uh, things that we're going to do, as well as what are the repair items that we need to add to the product backlog in order to uh, um, facilitate not having this hap thing happen again. Or maybe we need to make some s s critical architectural changes in our application uh, to stop those problems uh, persisting. Uh, if you're going to have live site incidents, you should really be transparent with your customers, with your stakeholders on what the problem is, why it happened and what you're going to do to fix it. Uh, the Azure DevOps team had radical transparency in this. Uh, Brian Harry published blog posts, which you can still find uh, online with uh, the full root cause analysis. Maybe not all of the internal stuff, but much of the data uh, they showed to show what was the problem, why it happened, what they did to fix it at the time, and what are the stuff that they're going to do in the future uh, to go make that thing go away. Um, the, the old adage that if you want to stop smoking, tell everybody you're stopping smoking uh, increases your likelihood to do something about it. Um, so make sure uh, uh, you, you have all of that stuff under your belt. And there's no such thing as partial automation. You need to automate everything. There is no value in having a script in OneNote or in an email uh, and copying and pasting it to run it. Um, if you were to run this PowerShell, uh, do you know what would happen? It would crash. Do you know why? Because of these quote marks uh, that OneNote changes to the funny quote marks instead of the vertical ones. Something as simple as that uh, can cause a problem. Um, what if you had hundreds of steps like this? What if you uh, um, had lots of different scripts and somebody misses a step from the process halfway through? Uh, this team actually uh, broke uh, pre-production for a whole day. That's uh, 650 software engineers not able to use pre-production uh, because somebody did a deployment manually incorrectly. Automate everything. If it can't be automated, architect it away so it can be automated. Automate everything. Um, I, if you're doing three-week sprints, you don't have time for manual processes. You don't have time uh, for a mistake in those manual processes to cost you time. You need to automate everything. Uh, less likely to make mistakes. And if you're going to do these big deployments, you need to use a, 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 the traditional model is we go from dev to uh, dev to QA to pre-production to production model, server-based uh, progression model, perhaps with branching uh, of code. That doesn't cut it anymore. We're going two weeks potentially shipping to production. Um, we need to use a controlled exposure uh, model. And the Azure DevOps team 
uh, really did a lot of good work around this. Uh, they have a ring-based system um, where uh, the first ring is the canary, which is internal users. So most people inside of Microsoft, except for Windows, because they're really big, um, are on the canary, canary system. Uh, and then the smallest external data center, which I believe is Brazil, uh, is where they deploy to next, minimize the impact of a problem, monitor that environment for a few days. They actually have automated tools to monitor it uh, and back out, stop rolling out if uh, there's a problem. Uh, and then, you know, smallest, then largest data center uh, on three, uh, the international ones. So that would be, uh, I don't know where they are, UK, uh, Europe, um, various international data centers. And then five is all the rest and the Windows team is in five because you don't want to break four and a half thousand software engineers in your company. Um, that's the model. Control your exposure to production. Get into production as quickly as possible, but control your exposure. Uh, you can do some of that with feature flags. Uh, you can also in big environments, you can do it uh, uh, with, mo you know, if you're mul multiple deployments of the same uh, platform, but get into production as quickly as possible and maintain a live site culture uh, so that you are able to um, really, really support uh, the teams going forward in production. I'm going to skip a couple of things because we are uh, running out of uh, time, I think. Uh, I think Heather will let me know if I have uh, lots of time. I'm happy to talk for hours, but I know you're not happy to listen for hours. Um, we have a little paradox we have to deal with. Uh, we have a, a speed versus control. We need control so we know what's going on, but we also need speed. Speed begets, uh, sorry, innovation and speed are tightly linked in reliability and control. That's the operations versus engineering discussion. Uh, so we need to minimize the high failure rate. Uh, and the one of the ways we do that um, at scale is with uh, uh, alignment versus autonomy. We need our teams to be autonomous in order to generate innovation. That's that self-managing teams that they talk about in Scrum. But we also need some level of alignment because we have 42 teams working across three locations around the world building on one product. We need some form of alignment. Um, I'm a big proponent of uh, Dan Pink's uh, book Drive. Uh, where he suggests that giving teams three things are really important, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. We want to feel like we're in charge of our own destiny, autonomy. We want to feel like we're good at what we do. That's mastery and purpose. You know, what we do matters to others around us. Uh, the work we do matters. But if we focus on autonomy, which is one of the ones that the, the organization can control, uh, we have a number of things. Uh, that are in play in any team or part of your organization. Um, and giving some level of autonomy to planning and practices, let them figure that out while providing alignment around the organization, the roles, the teams, the cadence, and the taxonomy. If you're doing a three week cadence for your product, everybody who works on your product needs to be on that three week cadence. It doesn't matter what other choices they make. On, inside of planning and practices, they need to show working software at the end of that three weeks. Tell us what they built at the end of that three weeks. It doesn't mean they have to do uh, at Scrum. Uh, you can do Kanban within Scrum. You can do Kanban while being on a cadence. Uh, there's nothing in Kanban that says you can't have a cadence. Uh, so having that alignment, but with autonomy, uh, gives you that uh, setup and really structuring your teams um, so that they're uh, Cool. Thank you, Heather. Uh, structuring your teams um, so that they are more cohesive. Uh, so Microsoft used to have program management, development, and testing as a separate branch. Um, I'm not going to say they didn't make a bunch of mistakes in figuring this out, okay? But what they uh, kind of ended up with uh, was program management, engineering, and still having some operations folks in the org chart, but uh, they moved towards a model of having a feature team that included representatives from all of that area. So that they've got operations to help manage uh, production. They've got developers that are writing the code that runs in production, and they've got product management that's understanding what the value is to the customer. Bringing all of that together, you are the group that is accountable. That is the Scrum team, which is a feature team, 
and they're engaging really closely with their customers. Um, it's really powerful. Uh, they actually found uh, that this is a little bit older, obviously uh, post COVID, um, the world has changed a lot. Uh, they used to encourage uh, physical team rooms. Um, today, uh, I would suggest that when we talk about face-to-face -face communication, uh, live uh, virtual communication works for that as well. So I'm just adding some more time to myself. There we go. Uh, they found that their team size needed to be between 10 and 12 people. Um, they're doing S S SRE, Site Reliability Engineering as well. So they have dedicated site reliability engineers on the team. That was the operations part, as well as members of the team that are dedicated uh, towards handling uh, those life site issues to relieve pressure on the team so that they can focus on value delivery. Um, that's their technique for doing that, uh, but they still operate as a single team, uh, just with slightly different focus and they rotate members uh, through that so everybody gets a chance to, to work on the live site issues. Uh, but they're self-managing, uh, they have a clear charter and goals, what they're trying to achieve, and they generally try and keep those teams together uh, for 12 to 18 months. They own production, they own deployment. Right? The people that write the code are the people that deploy the code are the people that support the code. That team is accountable for that. Um, and that works inside of uh, Azure DevOps, uh, supports all of the, you know, uh, SOX audit, um iso 9000 and all of the stuff they need uh in order for all of us to use their product uh, they support in that model uh, so you can too there's no need to have uh, the separation of concerns but you don't need separation of people it's more nuanced than that uh, they also every 18 months they keep their teams intact for between 12 and 18 months but at least every 18 months uh, they do team forming exercises where the teams reform themselves and choose how they're going to go together. They've done this a number of different ways. They've done sticky note uh, exercises where you put your names in the teams. Uh, they've done other types of exercises as well, um, including uh, um, they did a, what's it called? Proportional representation uh, last time uh, for teams across the three locations. Again, it's 650 people in different time zones. Uh, but it gives people the opportunity to change without formal interviews and it's not management driven it's the employees the, the team members choice at uh, what team they go on uh, that helps us as individuals joining a team we chose this team so if something's not quite how we expect it it's not because we were told to be there we chose this uh, that helps and it helps with career opportunities as well are uh, the cadence that I mentioned, the consort cadence that everybody has to be on. Uh, the, this is generally across the whole of Microsoft. They have this alignment. Um, they talk about sprints, which are uh, three weeks. Some teams uh, do four week sprints. Uh, some teams do uh, two week sprints, but in general, this particular group was three week sprints. And then they have quarters uh, uh, for this team. Um, and then semesters, which you might have heard Microsoft talk about the fall and the spring release, uh, and then strategy, they're looking 12 months out. So they have these different planning horizons. Uh, you know, you've got your current sprint, uh, uh, your quarter, which is four sprints, your semester, which is six sprints, and your strategy, which is uh, uh, a little bit more than 12 sprints. So they have that uh, looking out into the future. Yes, and um, inside of the sprints and the quarterly stuff, uh, the teams are responsible for the details. So the, the owners, the leadership does not impose individual backlog items or features. Uh, there might be things that they want, but they're generally looking more at the um, high level investment opportunity level. What over the next 12 months, what are our opportunistic investments? Uh, where do we need to invest our teams and our time and our money uh, for making progress in the in the market? and any market opportunities. So that's the instructions and direction they give to the team. And then the teams figure out what features they can deliver themselves. Uh, that's unique to Microsoft uh, because they build software that they use themselves. So they are their own customer, uh, but there are ways to do that within, within generally within the Scrum world. If you look at the Scrum guide and you look at uh, the Agile manifesto, you'll see some things around that anyway in the, in the story of getting closer to customers. Um, focus. Part of that alignment 
uh, is stop focusing on output. Uh, output is a horrible uh, metric for the creative world. Uh, we need to be focusing on outcomes. What do you want to happen? Are you getting that thing to happen? Are you getting value of the things we want to focus on? Um, and this team has used OKRs uh, in order to do that. That is one technique. Um, I don't hate OKRs and I don't love them. It's, it's a tool that may or may not work uh, for your organization. Um, and they have product level OKRs that roll down to the service level. So they might have the, the um, work item service uh, as one of those. And then each team has a set of OKRs that they're trying to achieve and they kind of roll up. Uh, so you would expect it to be a, a subset. So that's, that's alignment. That's part of this alignment story. That's not the autonomy. Um, and then they, they used to stay in sync. They don't do this anymore because they found there was too many emails. Every team would send a sprint mail to the whole group uh, that had a little uh, video, uh, whether they managed to achieve their OKRs this sprint, uh, what the data showed, um, what features they were creating. All of those things were part of that part of that email. Uh, they now consolidate that into a, 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 a smaller number of emails. Um, so that's a, a little bit more work, but it means that you don't have hundreds of emails hitting you at the end of every sprint and lots of uh, benefits uh, they managed to achieve uh, doing that. I have about 10 minutes left. Um, if I see uh, any questions pop up in the chat, um, I will uh, uh, allow you to have a little bit of time for questions. If not, I have nine minutes uh, to finish my story. Uh, I know maybe you want to hear the story because the next bit is quality and shift left. How do we get faster uh, at delivering that software, that, that piece that we talked about earlier of paying back the technical debt? Uh, well, when this team first started, uh, they had these massive amount of L3 full environment end-to-end -end tests. They were all automated but they were just massive and took a really long time uh, to achieve. Uh, so they had massive amounts of L3, uh, which are the end-to-end, -end, um, and very few unit tests, which were the L0. So that only requires the binaries, right? Um, and they made a concerted effort uh, to say, we need to flip that pyramid. We need to get rid of as many L3s as possible uh, and have as many L0s as possible. Um, so in the current test portfolio world it was taking them about 48 hours to run their full test matrix about i'm not sure of the exact number but about 48 hours um, and in the future test portfolio i know that the team got it down to three and a half minutes uh, for a full end-to-end -end test uh, of their product in visual studio so you can three and a half minutes is fast um, and that's uh, developers being able to test on their own uh, workstation but that took time an investment of time uh, to shift left uh, from integration to unit. Um, and you can see there that's over from M78, from Sprint 78, uh, all the way down to they got rid of the last, um, they call them TRAs, they're the horrible end-to-end -end tests that need the whole system uh, in uh, Sprint 120. Uh, so that was a long, uh, long tail. And you can see that sometimes they were successful it paying back that technical debt as the orange bar drops. Uh, and sometimes they weren't so successful between M87 and M98. They didn't do a lot of work on that. That was uh, just paying back some of them. And that was that's just the reality of building software. We have an ideal. Are we making progress? What are we going to do next? We can abandon it or we can keep going on it. Let's keep going. And they managed to pay it all back. And this is one of the things that got them to that much higher uh, frequency because uh, they got all of that automation in there uh, and now they can do rolling tests after commits uh, and, and really get a much more powerful test matrix uh, into that story and they can run those tests as part of their uh, pull request as well um, and any longer running tests uh, they can do as part of their pull request. Um, it means that they have much more vers versatility um, and you can see that they've split it into multiple sets so maybe they're running on multiple machines um, very powerful uh, story there. So somebody's asking if test plans um, play any role. Um, I, I would suggest that manual testing doesn't play any role in, uh, in agility. You can't have 60 manual tests per sprint 
add new features, sprint on sprint, and still be able to run all your tests. At some point, you're going to have to pick and choose. Uh, and if you're picking and choosing, you're missing something. Those tests existed for a reason. Automate everything. Uh, so I, I, I usually try and encourage teams to have on their definition of done that every test created during our sprint is fully automated by the end of the sprint. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see any manual tests at all. Um, if we have to have manual tests at the moment because of the way our software is architected, I want that team working on re-architecting the software so that it doesn't need manual tests, um, and then automate as many of them as you can, uh, work on that, pay it back. Uh, anything manual is technical debt. Anything manual is technical debt, whether that's a test um, or, uh, yeah, anything manual is a technical debt. Try, try and get rid of it as much as possible. Uh, people skip steps. That's just what happens. Uh, so here's just they 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 have uh, uh, lots of green automation checks from self test, uh, uh, code dev, self host. All of these are different parts of that test matrix that they have, uh, where some of them are testing unit tests, some of them are running uh, uh, other sorts of tests like upgrade tests and and various things. So uh, they have all of that built in. And then I have like five minutes. Well, maybe four minutes, depending on um how uh draconian heather feels today uh but they have a, a cloud cloud first mindset um it's funny that uh, the 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 british government have a cloud first mandate and it must be public cloud first um but nobody really follows it they don't understand that it's there cloud first is really important even if you're building an on-premise product and um, cloud needs to be more important because your your iterations are faster in the cloud. You're able to get feedback faster in the cloud. The faster you get feedback, the faster you can find that you're building the wrong thing and build more of the right thing. Um, so that's really important. Um, and having uh, if you're going to do an incremental rollout, uh, you're going to need to roll out across multiple uh, data centers. Uh, so think about how you set up your system uh, in order to support that. Obviously, this system is really big, really heavy load, uh, code being loaded in there. Don't scale if you don't have to. Um, you should be operating at the appropriate uh, uh, level of scale for the system uh, that you're running, but make sure you have uh, backup, you have redundancy, you have uh, all of the things that you need to do. Um, and the Azure DevOps team have been steadily moving towards converting all of their code to run uh, on Linux systems and Docker um because it's more efficient running docker on a linux system so they're moving everything to .NET core um and getting it all running in in docker and uh, as i understand uh, github is operating the same same way they're moving towards that model um how quickly they move that's depends on what features we need doesn't it so ultimately uh, don't <laughs> don't overthink things don't think too far in the future Figure out how to learn from failing. We're all going to fail. Um, that's just reality. That's how humans learn is through failure. Um, so we need to just one sprint at a time. What are we doing next? How do we make things just a little bit better every single sprint? Um, progress always follows uh, the, the J curve. Uh, you can have a read of that later. Uh, but I promise to tell you, and I'll tell you in the last minute, what are the things that changed for the Azure DevOps team? Uh, everything. How they uh, built the software, how they coded the software, how they organized their teams, how they organized their departments, um, how they did their roadmaps, how they uh, structured their business plans, how they funded the whole product changed over the life of this. Uh, uh, change, moving to inner source, moving away from big documentation, moving to smaller teams, uh, funding models, investment opportunities, uh, massive difference for the team, but also massive benefit. You saw the addition, the new features they were able to create. You've maybe used the product and know the change that's happened over the last 10 years. Um, DevOps is not uh, a magical uh, fire breathing unicorn. Uh, neither is agility, uh, but there are things you can do uh, to 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 get there to one step at a time. What's the next step you can make as a team within the scope of what you control 
to make things a little bit better. What can you do? What can you help somebody else do? Whose help do you need? Go and find out uh, uh, what you can change, what you can do. Make that first step, make something a little bit better. Maybe it's adding a unit test. Maybe it's creating an automated build. Maybe you're a scrum master and it's uh, removing that organizational impediment. Go, go do those things, but start with one thing at a time. And don't be afraid to make change. Thank you very much. This was a, an enterprise evolution that shows that you can too. Thank you, Pat.